The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled CAR T Cell Therapy Are You Up to the Challenge? New Evidence and Best Practices Driving Modern Cellular Therapies as a Standard of Care for Leukemia and Lymphoma. Access the entire activity and complete the post test at peerview.com forward slash DRW860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Well, good morning. Um, because of uh, time constraints, where we have one hour, I'm going to get I'm going to get things on the on the ball and get us started. Um, and I welcome you uh, to uh, CAR T cell therapy. Are you up to the challenge? And I'm I'm sure you are. Um, but we're gonna we're gonna try to even um, further fortify um, your abilities to do this. So um, I'm uh, Dr. Michael Bishop. I'm uh, Director of the David and Etta Jonas Center for Cellular Therapy. I'm joined by a good friend and colleague, Dr. Shannon Maud, and um, we would be, we are being joined virtually by Dr. Peter Rydell uh, from the University of Chicago. All right. So with that, I'm going to give a brief overview: uh, lessons from CAR T cell therapy and relapse refractory leukemia and lymphoma. This is, and for many of you, you're very familiar with uh, CAR T cell therapy, but this is just provides a, ba a background for those who are less familiar. Um, so this is a. Uh, 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 from a review article, and I actually thought this, the date was wrong. It was uh, by uh, Karen Jacobson. It was actually a commentary uh, to an early CAR T-cell uh, report in blood in 2011, but it still pretty much holds up today. So w what we go through with CAR T-cell therapy, there were first generation, which only had uh, the zeta chain as a stimulatory molecule for, for CAR T cell therapy. And, and there was a number of trials over approximately a 10 year period of time, which really didn't show much efficacy in any specific disease. It wasn't until we added a co-stimulatory domain. And the most co common co-stimulatory domains are C CD28 and 41BB that we actually started seeing clini clinical efficacy. And people have looked at what are referred to as third generation CAR T cells, which adds an extra co-stimulatory domain but those haven't really demonstrated any significant clinical benefit over those of a second generation CARs. And so how the CAR T-cell process goes is the patient has their T-cells collected by apheresis. Uh, they then, the T-cells are transfected with a CAR construct, with a, usually with a lentiviral construct, but there are other, other modalities that can introduce um, the construct into the cells and then the uh, it's a transmembrane expression with a receptor on the outside of the cell and the co-stimulatory domains inside. Um, most patients undergo lymphodepleting chemotherapy for two purposes. One is for disease control, but other one is to actually ablate the, um, the endogenous T cells within the body before the introduction of the CAR T cells. And this actually leads to an increase in homeostatic cytokines such as IL-7 and IL-15, which are very important to maintain the function and help with the proliferation and expansion of these introduced CAR T cells. And then the patients are monitored very closely for potential side effects, including um, uh, cytokine release syndrome and neurotoxicities, and then the patients are monitored for disease response re relative to the specific disease being treated. So currently, uh, we have, it's been a remarkable time over the past 10 years, uh, and a number of CAR T cell constructs have actually been approved. Uh, we have axacaptabine uh, silulosal, which uh, just received approval for adults with B cell lymphoma that have relapsed within 12 months of frontline therapy. It's also approved for adults with relapsed refractory diffuse large B cell after two or more lines of upfront therapy. And also uh, within the last year, it received approval for relapsed refractory um, B cell lymphoma more than two or more lines. We have Brexta Captagene which is uh, approved for adults with um, 
with relapsed B cell ALL and also adults with relapsed refractory mantle cell lymphoma. We have lysocaptogene marilusal, which is approved for large B cell lymphoma with two or more lines, but is undergoing FDA review in June for potential for patients with uh, relapsing after first line therapy. And then we have tezogen leclusal, uh, where it's approved for, uh, for patients uh, up to the age of 25 with B cell uh, ALL and also for adults with relapsed refractory B cell lymphoma, two or more lines. However, it is also undergoing review and actually thought to be that maybe we will hear from the FDA in the next coming weeks for the approval of follicular lymphoma. So here is, uh, as I'd mentioned, that after the infusion, one has to pay attention uh, for potential uh, toxicities, including cytokine release syndrome, which is manifested by fever, hypotension, tachycardia, and can actually lead to more severe, including uh, uh, capillary leak syndrome and severe hypotension and hypoxia, and in leading to another aspect of this in a most severe form of HLH and uh, a macrophage activating syndrome. Um, these generally occur early on the onset of CAR T-cell therapy and then are followed by neurologic events, including encephalopathy, tremor, dizziness, and delirium. Now, you look on this slide, and I actually think, you know, this is probably one that we will have to update, is generally all of these potential side effects um, can are mitigated um, through the use of, of uh, anti-IL-6 receptor and anti-IL-6 uh, monoclonal antibodies and corticosteroids and by, by day 28. Um, and it used to be thought that one could not see neurologic toxicities unless you saw cytokine release syndrome. Now, a topic that we are not covering today are um, CAR T cells for multiple myeloma. And we've learned that d depending upon the target, it can be a whole different aspect of, of timing of when cytokine release syndrome and neurologic toxicities occur. And then with some of the CARs for myeloma, we can actually see neurologic toxicities without CRS, and we can actually see delayed neurologic toxicity. So this is, I think, as we go forward with new CAR T cells, that it has to say it's not one size fits all when we're monitoring for toxicities. And with that introduction, I'm going to turn to uh, to Shannon, and uh, she's going to talk to us about CAR T cells and leukemia. Thanks so much, Michael. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about um, the current data that we have um, in ALL and um, leave you with hopefully some thoughts about where we um, may be going and how we can improve outcomes in ALL. So um, these curves here um, show you kind of where the, the current status is in pediatric ALL, um, which is you know, where um, CAR T cells had been uh, solely for some time up until very recently where we had approval um, of the kite product in adult ALL. But as you can see in the, the curve on the left, we've really made great gains with the intensification of multi-agent chemotherapy through clinical trials over the years, such that a child newly diagnosed with ALL has greater than a 90% chance of being cured of their disease. But unfortunately for that fraction that is not cured, the curve is, is nearly the inverse um, for those who are multiply relapsed with ALL. We've, we've really reached the limit of um, what we can do with intensive chemotherapy. And it's really into this landscape that um, CAR T cells first came as um, you know, we learned that CD19 was a very good target for B cell malignancies. Um, so what we have seen um, in ALL over the last five years, um, as uh, Michael has mentioned, has really been remarkable with several um, approvals um, that have come and um, several trials that are, that are likely re leading to approvals upcoming as well. So where we currently stand, there aren't quite as many products as there are in lymphoma, but um, Tisagen, Leclucel, um, 
had the first uh, CAR T cell FDA approval and first approved in pediatrics, um, which was amazing for um, the field in August of 2017. So that is approved in pediatric and young adult patients up to in including the age of 25. Um, and then very recently, um, in October of 2021, uh, KTEX19 or Brexusel was approved in relapse refractory adult ALL. So it's very nice to have a product available for adults with ALL now as well. Um, the Lysacel product uh, is being studied at the work that came out of um, Seattle and the Fred Hutch group with their cd 19 bb car that's being studied in um, phase one, two studies um, that are ongoing. And there are some universal cars, uh, UCAR 19, um, that is in a phase one study as well. So this is the early data that led to um, the first CAR FDA approval. This is the Eliana trial, which was um, a trial of children and young adults uh, up to the age of 25, led by Novartis. And this was a um, international um, multi-institutional trial that enrolled patients who were in second or greater relapse uh, with their ALL, relapsed after allotransplant, or who had refractory disease um, after upfront therapy or relapse therapy. Um, patients received lymphodepleting chemotherapy, a standard regimen of fludarabine and cyclophosphamide. Um, in the majority of patients, um, and then went on to receive a single dose of uh, Tisacel that was weight-based for um, smaller patients, less than 50 kilograms, and then flat dose at um, 50 kilograms or above. Um, on this trial, um, with the manufacturing slots and getting people enrolled early on, um, there were some delays to infusion in some patients, but overall the time from enrollment to infusion um, was actually quite good at uh, 45 days, that is a median time. The primary outcome was the overall response rate um, with secondary outcomes looking at duration of response um, and other outcomes as well. And so um, the overall response rate that was seen um, on this trial in the initial analysis um, was 81% CR, CRI uh, within uh, three months of infusion. This response required confirmation of the initial CR. So patients initially had their assessment at day 28 and that um, had to be maintained at month two. Um, so this response rate was really quite encouraging and similar to what we had seen on the phase one trial. Um, and the, the slightly um, lower response rate probably accounted for the patients um, requiring that maintenance of remission at that second time point. What was really um, of interest to the community and all of us was that the duration of response um, was quite good and matched what we saw in the phase one trial. So in the graph to the right is the duration of response with a 12-month uh, relapse-free survival, this initial analysis of 59%, with only eight patients undergoing subsequent stem cell transplant and remission. So it was just over uh, 10%. The majority of patients received no further therapy. And if you think about that in relation to that first curve I, I showed you a second or greater relapse, um, this was really quite encouraging. This is what led to the FDA um, approval of uh, the first CAR therapy in children and young adults. Um, so when we look at longer term follow-up, um, this is a, a subsequent analysis um, looking at the Eliana longer term follow-up um, and there are additional analyses being done looking even further out. Um, and what is encouraging, it seems at least in, in this um, very refractory and multiply relapsed population that um, while we do see early relapses, that we do see that um, the outcomes seem to plateau and uh, the longer term follow-up seems to hold up with what we saw in that initial follow-up. And this is continuing um, to be analyzed. 
So um, moving on to the, the next product that received FDA approval, the Zuma 3 study of um, KTE X19 was a phase 1 2 study, so initially dose finding and then um, had a, a phase 2 component that was expansion at um, the chosen dose of 1 times 10 to the 6 CAR T cells per kilogram. Um, this is the design of that uh, trial. Um, patients were um, enrolled and could receive some bridging therapy and then received um, conditioning chemo, which also consisted of flu sci in a slightly different um, composition. And um, then they were infused and assessed for response that should be at uh, day 30 um, after infusion. And so these were some of the initial outcomes reported um, on the adult trial of KTEX-19 um, and what led to FDA approval of this product for adults with relapse refractory ALL. The overall um, the CR rate here was uh, 69%. Um, on this initial follow-up, there's um, some more mature uh, data published in Lancet, which was um, close to that range, I believe 71% um, CR rate. Um, and they did some secondary analysis of duration of response and relapse-free survival as well. So this led to FDA approval in October of 2021 of uh, Brexucel. There's an ongoing uh, trial of that product in pediatric ALL, the Zuma 4 trial. Um, these are the initial phase one data that were dose finding, also landing on a dose of one times uh, 10 to the sixth. And there was a slight um, formulation change uh, in this product. And that uh, dose and change will be moving on to the phase two, which um, is currently ongoing. The phase two portion includes an NHL cohort um, as well. Um, so that trial is currently enrolling. The initial um, results that they saw in the phase one were comparable high um, CR, CRI rates of 78%, um, with most patients being MRD negative. So these initial um, studies, um, as we all know, are highly select uh, population that are stable enough to travel for a clinical trial, to enroll in a clinical trial, and, and um, wait for a manufacturer slide and cells to be manufactured. And so I think there was always the question, um, while these trials were ongoing at limited sites, whether this was going to hold up in the real-world setting. And we've been very encouraged to see um, some of the real-world outcomes. Um, what's the data shown here are out of the CIBMTR registry um, looking at initial patients uh, treated for relapse refractory ALL um, in the real world setting, treated with commercial uh, Tisagen Leclucel. And this is showing a comparable CR rate in the 85% range to uh, what we saw on the trial and encouragingly a comparable 12-month duration of remission um, in the 60% range. Um, the median follow-up here is just over a year at the time point of this analysis, so of course we'll need to see longer-term follow-up. Um, but given that we're seeing most events early on, we're hopeful that these real-world outcomes will continue to be comparable. Another analysis that was done recently and presented at ASH this year was looking at um, whether there were any differences in outcome in the uh, truly pediatric population, those less than 18 years old, compared to the young adults, the 18 to 25-year-old um, patients treated with Tisagen Leclucel. And um, this also out of the CIBMTR registry showed no difference in outcomes um, in those age groups, which was also um, very encouraging. So what um, this work has, has led us to see is that in ALL, we can achieve very high response rates, um, even in patients who are refractory to multiple other regimens. Um, but we do see a significant um, relapse rate in this population. And even though that relapse-free survival in the 50 to 60 percent range is uh, transformative in this population, um, we obviously want to do better. And we want to be able to um, 
improve those outcomes for those patients by hopefully being able to predict who are at higher re highest risk and are there things that we can intervene on. So in some analyses um, out of some of those initial pivotal studies out of um, Eliana, we were able to see some differences in outcome based on how long the CAR T cells persisted and based on some sensitive measures of uh, MRD. So in the graph to the left, this is showing B cell recovery, which um, is used as a marker of loss of CAR T cells because CD19-directed CAR T cells will clear your um, CD19 positive normal B cells as well. And so what is showing in the red and green curves at the bottom is patients who have B cell recovery indicating loss of CD19 CAR T cells by three or six months have um, much poorer event-free survival compared to those who have persistent uh, CAR T cells marked by persistent B cell aplasia. So that is one marker that we have used to um, assess the duration of that CAR T cell surveillance and use it as um, a, a tool to know when to intervene and think about other therapies for patients. And then to the right, some interesting newer data that we're seeing out of these trials is what was done as an exploratory analysis um, not revealed to the clinicians at the time was um, MRD by deep sequencing. So this can detect abnormal clones at a level of one in a million. Um, and what was seen in this analysis is that um, detectable NGS MRD at day 28 even um, more so at month three, which is what I show here, is predictive of um, worse EFS compared to patients who are um, MRD negative. Um, so that is something that I think we're learning how to incorporate into the monitoring of our patients and assess what we can do to intervene. So if we are able to detect um, who can, is at higher risk of relapse, what can we do to, prevent, to potentially prevent that? And there are a few um, strategies that several groups have employed. Um, our group has done a number of reinfusions um, and have uh, shown that we can prolong B cell aplasia, which we use as a, a marker of continued persistence, and see continued um, remissions in patients um, where reinfusion is effective. The group in Seattle has done, um, taken another approach of providing ongoing stimulation with antigens, so using um, APCs, using T cells as APCs to um, present the CD19 antigen to provide continued stimulation for the CAR T cells um, and have seen some improvements in persistence in that situation as well. And then there are a number of new trials um, that are ongoing to try to prevent relapse or to use in the post-CAR relapse setting. Um, we have a humanized CART-19 trial that's now in, in phase two and the initial phase one results shown here were encouraging for patients who had previously received a CAR-T cell and had short persistence of that CAR-T cell. Um, there are also an, um, trials looking at targeting other antigens like CD22 or multi-antigen approaches through various mechanisms, which I'm showing here, either um, I expressing the uh, two cars on the same cell or um, on the same car molecule or co-infusion of the car. A number of these are under clinical trials looking at, um, you know, how can we overcome relapse when it happens, or more importantly, um, can we prevent it from happening? So in summary, um, we're seeing high remission rates in relapse refractory BALL with up to 50% of patients having durable remissions. And we have now two products um, that are FDA approved in ALL throughout the age spectrum, which is wonderful. Um, but there are a lot of ways that we need to improve. Um, and so I think where the field is going is how can we improve upon the CAR T cells that we have and um, prevent predict and prevent relapse from happening. Well, thank you, Shannon. That's great. Um, so I am pleased to introduce my uh, friend and colleague, Dr. Peter Rydell. Um, so Peter will be talking to us on recent progress with CAR T-cell therapy and diffuse large B-cell and mantle cell lymphoma. Take it, Peter. 
Excellent. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much to the uh, meeting organizers for uh, the invitation and especially for accommodating my uh, virtual presentation. So today I'll be tasked with uh, discussing some recent progress in CAR T cell therapy and diffuse RHB cell lymphoma and mantle cell lymphoma and really specifically focusing on what do hemonc physicians and BMT specialists need to know about this treatment. So in terms of uh, you know, the practical shape of CAR-T cell therapy um, in these diseases, um, really it starts with finding an eligible patient. Um, right now, in the third line setting, CAR-T cell therapy is approved for patients who have failed two prior lines of therapy. Um, one of the things, of course, to always be mindful of is picking the right candidates for this treatment, um, including potentially steering away from this therapy in patients that have active uncontrolled infections and those that have uh, inflammatory disorders, specifically that which would require uh, treatment. Um, upon identifying patients, then it would be referring them to a specialized uh, academic center or treatment center for consideration of this option. Um, following collection of the patient's CAR T cells, they'll need to be monitored during the bridging therapy. And then the, really the treatment course starts with the initiation of lymphoid depleting chemotherapy, as was alluded to previously. Uh, and then subsequently, we're monitoring patients either in the context of an inpatient hospitalization or closely as an outpatient for evolution of any cytokine release syndrome or neurologic toxicity. And now we have sort of specified uh, grading and management uh, platforms, which have been developed by the ASTCT along with the NCCN. And then following the patient's treatment course, uh, we then sort of transition to more of a longer term follow up and management monitoring for any disease recurrence or relapse. And it's really at that point in time where typically the handoff is made from the academic or treating institution to the community oncologist. And so now in the third line setting in diffuse large B cell lymphoma, we have three FDA approved CAR T cell agents. The first approved was axicaptogen cellulosal or axicell. Uh, Tisogen like lucil was the second approved agent. And then more recently we have lysocaptogen neurolucil. Um, but additionally, I think it's important for us to understand really how the landscape of diffuse large B cell lymphoma has been changing. Um, when we had these three uh, agents sort of in different um, uh, settings of being approved in, in different time points, we've also had now uh, an increasing array of other agents to use in diffuse large B cell lymphoma in the relapse refractory setting, including lancosuximab tesserine, tapacitumab in combination with lenalidomide, uh, polituzumab bedotin in combination with bendamustine or tuximab along with selinexor. Um, and so really our, our treatment arsenal for, for diffuse large B cell lymphoma is increasing. Um, and, and some of these options in the latter part of the box here may be a consideration for patients that are either ineligible for CAR-T therapy or potentially have uh, failed that treatment option. And so this slide right here looks at uh, the different um, CAR-T constructs uh, that were evaluated in the clinical trials. Uh, we have the Zuma-1 study evaluating AxiCell, Juliet trial with TCGen like Lucil, and then the Transcend trial with Lysocaphagene Merilucil. Um, and I think the sort of important points to note here, um, looking at the uh, patients, this was all those that had either relapsed or refractory disease, which were enrolled. Um, sort of a different composition of those in terms of uh, which ones had previously undergone autologous stem cell transplant, but that was a commonly used modality. Um, and uh, again, all these three trials led to FDA approval of the agents. And so we'll go through a clinical case here just to uh, kind of frame the conversation. Uh, Brian is a 67-year-old gentleman with a history of stage four double hit diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. Uh, he's initially treated with six cycles of dose-adjusted REPOC, which is a common treatment strategy for patients uh, in the frontline setting. Initially, he did well with this therapy, and after six cycles of treatment, he achieved a PET-negative complete response. Um, but unfortunately, that response didn't last very long. And approximately four months after achieving a CR, he developed biopsy-proven relapse disease. Um, as per one of our standard treatment approaches, in the second line setting, he was challenged with platinum-based salvage chemoimmunotherapy with rice, which is a typical practice pattern in the US. Um, but unfortunately, after receiving two cycles of rice, he underwent disease restaging, which revealed progressive disease, 
which is a common finding, especially in patients with early relapsed or primary refractory disease. And so, you know, in this setting, in patients that have failed two prior lines of treatment, again, we now have three FDA-approved agents, and we'll sort of go through the, the data um, from the three pivotal trials. And so this outlines the data from the Zuma-1 study, which eventually led to approval of AxiCell, um, with a initial report of a median follow-up of 27.1 months. We see very high objective response rates of 83%, encouraging CR rates of close to 60% with a median duration of response of 11.1 months. Um, now, we also, with the upcoming Congress presentations, have even more long-term follow-up data from this study, including four-year and five-year um, outcomes. And we can see here with the median follow-up of 51.1 months, uh, the median overall survival in this population was 25.8 months. Um, and I think really the other encouraging point to see here is that there is appear to be a plateau in this survival curve, indicating that we may actually be achieving long-term responses and potentially a hint to a cure for some of these patients. This is a result from the Juliet trial, uh, which again led to approval of TCGN like Lucil in the third line setting for patients with, with diffuse large B-cell lymphoma and other variants of aggressive large B-cell lymphoma. Um, we can see sort of a similar story here uh, in terms of the uh, progression-free survival and long-term outcomes of patients. The 24 and 36-month PFS rates were 33 and 31% respectively um, with high overall response rates. And again, those patients that uh, do achieve CR um, and maintain complete response are, again, the patients that do uh, better long-term. And additionally to note, uh, we do have now encouraging uh, data from the use of these products in the real world, specifically with TCGN like Lucil, which has shown a very similar safety profile, or I'm sorry, very similar efficacy profile, and uh, likely an even more encouraging safety profile than that noted in the, uh, in the pivotal Juliet trial. And this is data from the uh, Transcend trial uh, evaluating lysocathogen Neralucil, also in the third line setting. Um, this trial enrolled a little bit of a larger patient population in terms of numbers and did additionally have slightly broader eligibility criteria and roll in a little bit of a different uh, subtypes of uh, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, including those that had transformed disease from more indolent histologies outside of follicular, it also included uh, follicular lymphoma grade 3B. Um, but again, we can still see here um, the same trend where we're seeing really encouraging progression-free and overall survival rates in patients. Uh, we see overall responses around the 70% range and complete responses close to the 50% range. Um, and including uh, longer follow-up has demonstrated really that these responses do appear to be durable. Um, we can see here again, as outlined in the overall survival curve, um, some flattening of that curve with time, which is certainly really encouraging. Um, additionally, with now having these therapies been FDA approved since 2017, we have uh, increasing uh, comfort with using these products in the commercial setting. And this is data actually from the Cell Therapy Consortium that I helped lead, uh, which evaluates outcomes in patients which were treated with either commercial AxiCell or commercial TISA cell. Uh, at centers that had the option of prescribing either product. Um, and I think what you can see here on the left of the slide gives the progression-free survival cap and Meyer curve, and on the right is the overall survival curve. And we can see here that really uh, in this unmatched uh, comparison that there does appear to be equivalent uh, rates of progression-free and overall survival with these two products. Um, which again uh, does uh, certainly argue that this is a therapy which can be safely provided to likely a, a larger population of patients. Um, in this uh, evaluation, between 40 and 60 percent of those people that did eventually receive either AxiCell or TCCell would have actually been ineligible for the pivotal trials although the outcomes do appear pretty comparable um, from an efficacy standpoint, and certainly the safety was more favorable than that noted in the uh, Zuma-1 and Juliet trials. So when we think about uh, offering CAR T-cell therapy in the real world, there's certainly some barriers that we need to um, work to, to try to overcome and, and that potentially do limit our application of this treatment. 
Um, one, of course, being disease progression. Um, there is, uh, as Shannon has sort of alluded to, um, there is a lot of logistics to navigate when uh, taking a patient through CAR T-cell therapy, including getting disease uh, control, um, Prior to collecting their CAR T cells, we need insurance approval. There may be a need for bridging therapy. And so in, in some instances, the, the kinetics of the disease may outpace our ability to get them this therapy. Uh, additionally, we need to be mindful of infections that occur in these patients as they're frequently heavily pretreated. And, uh, and that may um, also limit our ability to treat patients. Uh, we have seen where infectious complications and active infections actually do increase our risk of developing cytokine release syndrome, which may be more serious or severe. And that's something to certainly be uh, mindful of as we're taking patients through this treatment approach. Um, also with this being an autologous CAR T cell treatments, uh, there are risks of manufacturing failure as really each of these manufacturing attempts is individualized for each patient. Um, and additionally, along with manufacturing failure, there has also been issues with manufacturing delays and getting slots for patients to be treated with this therapy. Um, and then of course, uh, additional struggle that we uh, have in the field is socioeconomic barriers and access to treatments. Um, and so really this is, this is where many of our recent efforts are focusing on to trying to overcome some of these barriers in order to uh, increase our ability to provide this treatment to patients in need. And so when we think about what's next for CAR T cell therapy and large cell lymphoma, um, as many of us are aware in the room here, there's now been three large phase three clinical trials which have been evaluating the application of CAR T cell therapy in the second line setting. Um, and these were particularly employed in patients with diffuse large B cell lymphoma that was either primary refractory or relapsing 12 months or less after conclusion of induction therapy. And in these studies, they essentially compared CAR T cell therapy to standard of care approaches, which would be platinum based salvage chemotherapy, and then if responsive, moving on to an autologous stem cell transplant. Uh, the first study uh, enacted was the Zuma 7 study, but we also now have data from the Belinda trial and the TRANSFORM study, which were all presented at the most recent ASH Congress. Um, each of these trials had a similar primary endpoint of event-free survival, although there were certainly differences in how that was assessed and trial design, which may account for some of the differences in outcomes that we've seen. Looking at the first uh, trial is the phase three Zuma 7s trial, again, comparing AxiCell to standard of care salvage chemotherapy and autologous stem cell transplant in the second line setting. The study uh, to date has had the most robust follow-up at close to 25 months. Um, and encouragingly, it did show uh, improvements of event-free survival. The 24-month EFS was 41% for the AxiCell arm compared to 16% in the standard of care arm. We also did see higher overall response rates in patients in the uh, AxiCell arm uh, compared to the standard of care. And also some hint that there may be improvement in overall survival, although certainly we do need much longer follow-up of this study to really better understand that. Um, and as of April 1st of this year, uh, we actually, based on this data, did uh, obtain FDA approval for the use of AxiCell in the second line setting, specifically for those patients that are either primary refractory or relapse within 12 months of conclusion of first line chemoimmunotherapy. Uh, the second clinical trial that was uh, enacted evaluating uh, the same uh, population of patients was the Belinda trial, which evaluated TISA cell versus standard of care in the second line setting. And it's, again, as I mentioned, there were some differences in patient populations enrolled along with the trial design um, and additionally the, the time to infusion of these cellular therapy products. And so that may have accounted for some of the differences in the outcomes that we saw in these different trials. Uh, the Belinda trial, unfortunately, did not show an improvement in outcomes uh, for the standard of care or for the uh, experimental arm, the TCGen like Lucille arm over standard of care where we saw a comparable median event-free survival of three months in both of these arms. Um, and again, more uh, investigation is really needed for us to better understand why that was the case. And, and also, I think as a field, we need to uh, ideally use this information to help the, and inform the design of future uh, prospective clinical trials in this space. 
Uh, the last trial that was uh, presented and we now have maturing data on is uh, the TRANSFORM study, which evaluated lysocathagene merilucil compared to standard of care in a second line setting. Um, this was a trial uh, designed similar to um, the others. Um, in this trial, patients did undergo uh, apheresis and collection of their T cells prior to being randomized. Uh, and those patients randomized to the uh, lysocell arm uh, did uh, demonstrate an improvement an event-free survival of 10.1 months versus 2.3 months in the standard of care arm, um, along with uh, you know, some improvements as well in overall response rate and CR rate. Um, the median follow-up of this trial is significantly less at 6.2 months, at least at the ASH presentation. So we do eagerly await more mature follow-up from this, but uh, very likely the results of this trial may lead to uh, FDA approval of uh, CAR T cell therapy of lysocell in the second line setting, potentially as early as June of this year, giving our patients now an additional option for CAR T cell treatments uh, in the second line treatment approach. And so sort of circling back to the, the clinical consult, again, 67 year old gentleman with uh, diffuse large B cell lymphoma, double hit phenotype, uh, progressing on chemoimmunotherapy after six cycles of our EPOC. Um, and so when we think about, you know, how to manage this patient now in the current era, now that we have CAR T cell therapy approved in the second line setting, I think this is certainly uh, a reasonable option for this patient. But I think really um, what this does help to emphasize is that as the treatment landscape is rapidly evolving in diffuse large B cell lymphoma, that really early referral to a specialized center is really crucial for uh, the CAR T cell and, and transplant physicians to really determine what are the best next steps for this patient. And if CAR T cell therapy is a reasonable option in, the, in these uh, high risk patients. And so now we'll shift gears slightly to the use of CAR T cell therapy in mantle cell lymphoma. Um, and again, sort of similar uh, workflow as we had with patients with diffuse large B cell lymphoma um, or patients with MCL that may be relapsing after prior chemoimmunotherapy or also after uh, BTK inhibitor therapy may be uh, ideal candidates for this treatment approach. Um, one of the things to be mindful of is in patients that do progress on BTK inhibitor therapy, it may be important to continue that treatment even though the patients do appear to be clinically progressing on treatments, um, as in many senses, it, it can sort of put the brakes on to a degree, the uh, clinical relapse that, that patients are seeing. And, and we have seen instances where BTK inhibitor therapy was discontinued and patients have a much more aggressive uh, relapse um, and, and are certainly sicker when they're coming into CAR T cell treatment. Um, in terms of uh, referral uh, after patients do establish care with a referring center, they will uh, similarly undergo collection of their T cells and then following manufacture, undergo lymphodepleting chemotherapy and then monitoring it usually in the context of an inpatient hospitalization. And then following their disease assessment, they're returned back to their referring provider for monitoring of relapse. Um, and based on the results of the Zuma 2 trial, brexacathagene autolusal or brexacel uh, was FDA approved for patients with relapse refractory MCL after failure of one line of prior therapy. And that was based on the Zuma 2 trial, as I mentioned. Um, in this trial, uh, patients had relapse refractory MCL treated with the minimum one to five prior lines of therapy. All the patients in this study additionally had previously been exposed to a BTK inhibitor. Um, although, uh, importantly, that is not a requirement for the use of this treatment in the second line setting, um, at least per the current FDA label. Um, in this uh, clinical trial, patients could have optional bridging therapy as stipulated here, and then followed by conditioning therapy with fludarabine and cyclophosphamide, followed by a single CAR T cell infusion of two times 10 to the six CAR positive cells per kilogram, followed by uh, tumor assessment at 30-day mark. Uh, we can see here 
based on the uh, three Kaplan-Meier curves, uh, pretty encouraging results. Overall response rate close to 90% and CR rate of 67%. Uh, again, really impressive duration of response in this population. Um, and if we look at the progression free and overall survival, we do also see um, some suggestion of flattening of the curve here. Um, which is really encouraging for our patients, especially those that have failed BTK inhibitor therapy. As we know, the outcomes in that population are particularly dismal, with many reports suggesting uh, overall survival of uh, close to about six months in that population. And then more recently at the uh, last ASH Congress, we did have some real world data, which was also suggest that uh, we're seeing some very similar results with the app application of Brexacel in the commercial setting. Uh, one of the other CAR T cell products that we have now in late stage clinical development in mantle cell lymphoma is Lysacel, which is evaluated uh, in one arm of the Transcend NHL study. Um, this was sort of operationalized very similar to how uh, Lysacel was, was utilized in diffuse large B cell lymphoma in, in that arm of the study. Um, they picked a population of patients with MCL that had failed at least two prior lines of therapy, including a BTK inhibitor, an alkylating agent, and an anti-CD20. Uh, they did uh, specifically allow uh, secondary CNS involvement, um, as that was uh, excluded in others' trials. And they also did uh, permit patients uh, to have an ECOG performance status up to two. Um, following enrollment in leukapheresis, the patients uh, could get optional bridging therapy. And then uh, upon confirming PET positive disease, they underwent lymphodepleting chemotherapy along with their lysocell infusion, uh, initially at uh, a dose exploration with uh, two dose levels, uh, eventually landing on a dose of uh, 100 million cells. Um, this gives some of the clinical data from that study. Uh, we see here that uh, overall response rate of 84% in that trial, including a complete response rate of 66%. Um, and then also a pretty favorable safety profile, especially when we overlay this with some of the other CAR products. Uh, we see all grade cytokine release syndrome at 50%, all grade neurologic toxicity at 34%. Um, and in the right side of the figure here, we see the swimmer's plot, which gives us an understanding of the outcomes of these patients. Uh, but median duration of response has not been reached to date um, with uh, a relatively short median follow-up of those. So this is certainly something that we do need a little more mature data to understand the impact of this therapy. And so to sort of summarize, uh, for patients with uh, diffuse large B cell and mantle cell lymphoma, CAR T cell therapy is certainly now uh, an impactful treatment, which leads to durable remissions in approximately 40% of patients with relapsed refractory aggressive large B cell lymphoma in the third line setting. Uh, and now we have three FDA approved products in that uh, treatment setting. And additionally, we now have an approval of AxiCell on the second line um, and potentially an upcoming approval of Lysacel on the second line for patients which are primary refractory or early relapsing. Um, we know that prognosis in patients with mantle cell lymphoma that fail BTK inhibitor therapy is poor. And thankfully now we have a new treatment approach um, in this context, including uh, uh, CAR T cell therapy uh, with a potential approval in the near future for uh, lysocell in that setting as well. Um, and uh, hopefully with, with some of this more mature data, we should have a better understanding about how to actually uh, use these different medications and in which uh, patient populations they're most appropriate uh, to be employed in. There we go. All right, so I'm gonna close it up with a CAR T cell therapy in follicular lymphoma and chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Um, it's important, uh, we generally think of follicular lymphoma as a disease for, for which there is a prolonged overall survival, but not all, not all cases are like that, particularly patients who uh, have relapsed of disease in less than 24 months after frontline therapy, and then the survival uh, significantly drops after second-line therapy. So very similar to what we have seen in the landscape, um, these patients can be considered for CAR T-cell therapy. Um, they undergo the very uh, similar process that uh, we'd seen in the other things. Um, there, as I had mentioned before, there is approval uh, for uh, AxiCell in uh, second line uh, patients with two or more lines of prior therapy. This is based upon uh, the Zuma 5 data that is seen in front of you. I think this is really important um, data because note 
that this also included patients with marginal zone lymphoma, which are shown on this Kaplan-Meier curve in the green. And uh, so when you look to the left, you can see that the um, duration of response was relatively short with marginal zone lymphoma but as compared to follicular lymphoma. So not all indolent lymphomas are the same. And actually when you break this up and go to the Kaplan-Meier curves to the right, they break it down based upon whether the patients achieved a complete response or a partial response. And you can see that the, the data remains relatively still dismal in marginal zone lymphoma, even among those patients who achieve a complete remission. And even in the patients with follicular lymphoma who achieve a partial response, you can see the curves actually drop off after, after uh, eight months. So, but the data is very encouraging relative to those, the majority of patients who achieved a complete response. And so looking at progression-free and overall survival, you see a very similar curves in terms of the left in regard to progression-free survival, again, with disappointing results with marginal zone lymphoma. The only thing that we can take home in some encouraging aspects for those patients, when you look at the overall survival curves, patients with marginal zone lymphoma actually did relatively well. So, and with the follicular lymphoma uh, also, that we're seeing uh, over 75% overall survival uh, from these two cohorts. Uh, the other trial that has looked at uh, the use of CAR T cells in follicular lymphoma is the ALARA trial using uh, TISA cell. You can see that the complete response rate was nearly 70% and uh, with a uh, with, uh, overall response rate of over 85%, and what you're looking to on the right is duration of response, and, and this is also highly encouraging where we're seeing probability of event-free survival approaching that of, of 60%, and again, with relatively low toxicities, and this study is under review right now uh, for potential FDA approval, and we should be hearing about that in the coming weeks. Um, so here on the ALARA trial is showing progression-free survival and um, again uh mirroring that of the event-free survival, but look to the right, and again, the overall survival is over 95%. Uh, uh, and again, this is in a, a number of patients who had had a significant number of, of uh, prior therapies. And when you look down at the uh, longer follow-up and greater five, greater five lines of therapy, you can actually see the results actually hold up pretty well. And I can just, as a person who treats a lot of lymphoma, these results are, are, are really markedly significant uh, as compared to available therapies in these latter, in latter lines of therapy. So in relative to uh, follicular lymphoma, I, I, again, lots of options, but I think these are very, very impressive results relative to uh, achieving complete remission and durability of response in this patient population. Um, so the other, uh, we're going to turn quickly to chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Uh, and it just, it's important to note that the first uh, clinical uh, efficacy of CAR T cells came in chronic lymphocytic leukemia, and we thought there would be a lot more data more up to this time, but we did find that, that, that those initial promising results are some limitations, which appears to be reflective of T cell function and uh, within chronic lymphocytic leukemia. But there's some encouraging data coming from the Transcend CLL004 trial. Um, in this, these were patients who uh, with relapsed CLL, SLL, and had to have had either uh, failed a BTKI or were intolerant of it. In this specific trial, they were looking at toxicity, look at two different doses of CAR T cells at 50 versus 100 million cells. And um, in this, you can see that we're, we're looking at um, overall response rate for the two doses at 82% with very similar uh, responses uh, between the 50 million and 100 million cells. And then looking to the right, this is um, where you could not detect, this is, uh, this is not only MRD, but undetectable MRD looking at blood and marrow. You can see pretty uh, significant responses in 75% in the blood and 75% the lower at the lower dose and 60% at the higher dose. This is now in phase two study where they're actually using the 100 million uh, cells. So looking at this initial, again, remembering this is a phase one toxicity trial, the probability durable response is actually 
uh, relatively good in progression-free survival, what we're looking at, and approximately 50% at 20 at uh, median follow-up of, of 18 months. So uh, encouraging results, and I, I think that we are going to see more and more trials relative to um, uh, CLL as an, a number of, of uh, companies are looking at using their specific products. So in this uh, we can see that uh, lysocell monotherapy had durable responses, high response rates with a very good toxicity profile and there is this exploration of, uh, of using a brutinib concurrently to improve T-cell function. I would like to thank you all very very much um, for your um, uh, participation and and for and we are all available now to take questions. If you want to come to the microphone, we're going to be here for a while. Um, any specific questions at this time? There's um, one question um, or a couple questions in the chat, but the one I'll take um, from uh, David Jacobson is about using NGS MRD to make decisions about um, allo BM BMT postcard um, in ALL and you know, how do we decide to go to transplant? Um, it's a really good question, thank you for that. And I, I think we are learning how to incorporate that NGS MRD now that um, we have those data and, and have started using it clinically. Um, I will say that our general practice is to, um, it is to follow up with a, a close subsequent bone marrow and if the NGS MRD is rising, um, then we have used that to go on to um, other therapy, usually including BMT, so often giving the patient a therapy to try to bring it down or at least have sta stabilized um, prior to going to BMT. Um, but in some cases, you see very low levels um, and uh, the, the data um, suggests that if you have NGS negative uh, MRD at three months um, with persistent B cell aplasia that most of those patients do quite well. So I think our current status is, is following that closely and acting with rising MRD. Well, I was going to ask you that same question, so I'm glad that came to the chat. And Peter, I have a question for you. When you presented the data for the CAR T cell consortium, um, you you um, appropriately noted these were not matched. Could you describe some of the characteristics of why um, it, you could tell that why uh, certain patients were receiving Tezacel and why certain patients were receiving Axicel as all of these centers had a choice between the two products? Absolutely. So one of the things that we did note uh, when analyzing the data is, is that, you know, typically the patients that were recipients of TISA cell were actually a slightly older age uh, with a, a higher percentage of those patients, which were an advanced age of 65 years of age and older. Additionally, uh, that population of patients had a, a more of a, uh, in terms of their disease status, it was more likely that they were relapsed as opposed to primary refractory uh, when they were entering their CAR T cell treatment. Um, uh, compared to those recipients of AxiCell. Um, additionally, we did see that uh, patients that were treated with T-cell actually did have a higher comorbidity burden compared to uh, recipients of AxiCell. Okay, thank you. And Shannon, I'm gonna come back to another question. As Peter had shown that CAR T-cells are being used more um, frequently in earlier lines of therapy, in, in particularly diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. Um, could you uh, comment about the potential use of the earlier use in acute lymphoblastic leukemia? Yeah, it's a great question. I think that um, there are um, some trials ongoing that are studying that. Um, there's a trial within um, the children's oncology group as well as with um, some of our European um, colleagues and consortium uh, looking at incorporating Tisicel into frontline therapy for patients who have uh, persistent MRD after two cycles of frontline therapy. Um, we have seen in uh, uh, that certain population that the five-year DFS is 39% with conventional therapy. And so what we're hoping to do is see if CAR T cells, um, at, even as a single agent, can improve those outcomes um, with most patients not requiring transplant. And there's um, work being done um, in individual institutional trials and first relapse and um, trying to uh, develop a larger trial within the consortium as well. Great. And with that, we're going to conclude. Thank you again for, uh, 
for uh, attending this session. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash DRW860. This activity is supported by educational grants from Bristol Myers Squibb, Kite, a Gilead Company, and Novartis Pharmaceuticals Corporation.